the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco. This is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Nice to have everyone here looking out our beautiful windows at San Francisco Bay. Great to be resuming live luncheons again. Uh, I want to acknowledge as a part of our live luncheons again that it's fun to have great speakers and it's even more fun to have great buddies who bring friends of the speakers or other, other knowledgeable parties to our talks. And one such is one of my dear longtime lifelong buddies, Ray Lint, staff commodore at San Francisco Yacht Club. Ray has brought several people today. Ray, would you uh, please stand up and introduce your table? And our president of the San Francisco Maritime National Park Association, Darlene Plumtree, is here. Darlene, Carl's wife. Wonderful. Ray, thank you so much. Our speaker today was not born in the Bay Area, but rather in Seattle. And uh, as he was growing up, occasionally he would hear about uh, Grandpa's yacht, the presidential yacht. And um, at one point, uh, he... Uh, went off to college at UC Santa Cruz and became a banana slug. Uh, he got over that pretty well and then became a teacher. And a couple of years ago, um, uh, he observed an ad asking for someone who might have an interest in being the executive director of the Presidential Yacht Potomac. And of all the coincidences, not only would he be the grandfather of the president who used the Potomac, but he'd be an experienced nonprofit executive with about 18 years of good nonprofit experience. So he applied, and they did not realize what a whirlwind they would get when they brought our speaker today to the job of being executive director of the USS Potomac, Ford Roosevelt. Ford, welcome to the stage. start by um, playing a video as an introduction that will tell the story of the USS Potomac in a very colorful way and it's only about 12 minutes long or so so bear with me while I forget how to use um, this computer there we go on the plane site the presidential yacht Potomac anchored off Nassau. So let's go aboard with them for our first visit with the president since he went fishing. He looks fine, rested from the cares of state as he entertains the governor of the Bahamas and then holds an informal press conference for the flying correspondents and Pathé News. So let's ask a question too. Mr. President, how big was the fish you say you caught? Well, not quite a whale, but it's more than most fishermen catch. 
This Pathé newsreel was made in 1936. A cruise on the Potomac was FDR's way of getting respite from the strains of office. The 32nd president of the United States came to the White House in the midst of the Great Depression. Bread lines, veterans selling apples on street corners, people lining up for soup kitchens. In his first inaugural address, Roosevelt delivered a message of hope to the American people. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. Americans wanted action, and the new president supplied that action in his first 100 days in office. <laughs> He proposed a flood of emergency legislation to deal with the crisis. The National Recovery Act, NRA, put some 4 million unemployed back to work. The Works Progress Administration, WPA, spent billions on flood control, slum clearance, student scholarships. The Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC, took unemployed young men off the city streets, 2.5 million of them and put them to work preserving our forests and conserving our natural resources. The Congress passed virtually every bill the President submitted. Facing economic disaster, this confident man radiated zest and optimism. Roosevelt was a polio victim. He couldn't walk on his own, couldn't even stand without leg braces and a supporting arm. His options for recreation escape from the pressures of the job were limited. An especially appropriate solution was found, a Coast Guard cutter built in 1934 in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. The Navy fixed it up for presidential use, anchored it minutes away from the White House, and commissioned it the USS Potomac. The press immediately called it the Floating White House. It became a symbol of FDR's presidential style. Chin up, flags flying, on the move. Here, the president entertained world figures like the king and queen of England. He twisted the arms of legislators. Or he just relaxed with family and close personal friends. FDR's eldest son, James, remembered these times fondly. James is on the right in this photo. It was really for the fun and entertainment of all of the boys being together with father and the water. We all love the water. We love sailing. The all-riveted ship suited the man and the times. It was not a rich man's yacht, by any manner of means. It reflected the Roosevelt family style. FDR's own stateroom was austere. No gold-plated fixtures in the presidential wash basin. The wicker furniture in the fantail section was simple but comfortable. The dining room, modest and functional. A small between-the-decks elevator, hand-operated by rope and pulley, was built into this false stack. It allowed FDR to get from one part of the ship to another with relative ease. Jack Lynch, a Navy yeoman who served on the Potomac between 1940 and 41, described how the president would come aboard after his car pulled up to the gangway. He'd swing his legs out and be helped a bit. He'd get right, to the, right up against the, the uh, brow coming over to the ship and he uh, grasped hold of it with both hands and all his legs were useless from polio, he couldn't use them. Because of that, he had exercised a lot and swam a lot, and he had very well-developed shoulder and chest muscles, and he could practically support his whole weight on his hands. The Potomac gave FDR an opportunity to escape from the dull menus of Mrs. Nesbitt, housekeeper at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Father enjoyed the food outside of the White House any time he could get it. This is this was very put out. The president loved to fish. He was lucky sometimes, and like an old fisherman, sometimes he wasn't. He didn't particularly care, I don't think. It was more just to be out in the exercise. At the end of the day, FDR would wheel himself to his stateroom to read the messages from the radio room, look over his stamp collection, or work on a speech. The Potomac sailed mostly on Chesapeake Bay. But the president also had the ship ply the waters of the Atlantic coast and up the Hudson River to his Hyde Park home, 70 miles north of New York City. His dog, Fala, enjoyed these trips home, 
especially the rides in the president's hand-controlled Ford convertible. Fallow went on most Potomac trips. Once, the Scotty was left behind in Newfoundland by mistake. Naturally, the ship went back to pick him up. And the press loved it. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, security was beefed up aboard the Potomac. And we were heavily armed. We had, uh, we didn't have Uzis in those days, but we had Thompson submachine guns, and we had 45 uh, counter Colts, and uh, we had uh, generous ammunition allowance. We used to practice all the time, go to ranges on the beach and practice. The Potomac carried the president part of the way to a secret meeting at sea. He went openly as far as Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Then he was transferred to an American battleship, proceeding through submarine-infested waters to meet Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Great Britain. There, the two men forged the Atlantic Charter, which eventually led to the Allied victory over Nazi Germany in 1945. After FDR died, President Truman sold the Potomac. During the next three decades, it changed hands several times. One of her owners, Elvis Presley, gave the yacht to entertainer Danny Thomas for a St. Jude's Hospital fundraiser. The once cherished vessel declined after that. In 1980, it was seized by U.S. Customs during a drug running operation in San Francisco. Impounded at Treasure Island, her hull was pierced one night and she sank to the bottom of the bay. U.S. Customs raised the ship and towed her to Oakland for auction. The port of Oakland got her for $15,000, unadorned and rotting. There were no other bidders. When James Roosevelt learned of the sorry state of the Potomac, he flew to Washington from his home in Southern California and asked President Reagan for a matching grant of $2 million to restore the Potomac. Despite budgetary limits, the president upped the figure to two and a half million and persuaded Congress to approve the grant. The Potomac resided on the banks of the estuary while fundraising, design, and planning took place. Seven years passed before the restoration literally got off the ground. In July 1988, a crane lifted the Potomac onto a barge. Destination, the Kohlberg Shipyard in Stockton, California. Using the original blueprints, shipyard owner Wilton Kohlberg tackled the enormous project, assisted by a team of first-class craftsmen. Engineer Jim Arrow was surprised to discover that the Potomac's basic structure was sound. I have not yet found a bad rivet on the Potomac from the original hull of the ship. Just absolutely super. During the next four years, Dan Holgate supervised the restoration, the main reconstruction having been done at the Kohlberg shipyard, where the mighty 1943 Enterprise engines were installed to power the ship. We're standing here in the engine room of the Potomac. These two Enterprise DMG, 26, 500 horsepower apiece engines, which were donated by Crowley Maritime Association. I never thought in my wildest dreams that this vessel would ever be where it is today. The finish work was completed at the Port of Oakland's Jack London Square with volunteer and paid workers. A member of the Potomac Board of Governors and former shipwright, Rick Anderson, laid down teak decking in the fantail section. The pilot house was equipped with the original doors, binnacle, and steering stand. 
The rest of the pilot house is furnished with up-to-date equipment required by the U.S. Coast Guard. An operational elevator was installed in the fall stack. Sailors' bunks were placed in the crew's quarters. The radio room was equipped with a 50-year-old telephone and telegraph system. Donated lifeboats and Chris Crafts were installed on the top deck. And an accurate replica of FDR's stainless steel bathtub was fitted into the president's bathroom. Everything that could be done was done to bring the past back to life. It was almost as if Holdgate and his restoration team were building a movie set for a World War II film, except that all these props actually worked. The ship is moored at the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Pier at the Port of Oakland. Here, thousands of citizens in years to come will visit Oakland to get close to a president and the momentous times in which he lived. One of the primary missions of the Potomac is to serve as an educational facility for the children of Oakland and the Bay Area. Under the guidance of teachers and docents, school children like these students from Oakland's Northern Light School will explore every corner of the Potomac and learn something about the history of our nation in ways that no textbook can quite convey. Okay, will we all gather here for a second? It was really over here rather than back there. And that's where food was served from. It was cooked in the galley at the bottom. Now fully restored and in operating condition, the Potomac constitutes a unique national treasure, not only for the people of the Bay Area, but for all Americans. my perspective, it tells a very good story. And I want to tell you that my remarks today, when I, I've done a, a number of talks in the last year about the Potomac, my, my main goal is to make sure you get one of these before you leave and you find a cruise on there you can, you can go to. How many of you have been on the Potomac on a cruise? Okay, about half, yeah. more or less. So the rest of you have to go. It's a remarkable experience and you'll tell stories about it for quite some time afterwards. And I think that that's what I've sort of devolved into is a storyteller about, about my grandparents, about Franklin and Eleanor, about my dad, Elliot, and sort of the frame of reference of what this ship means to me and why. Um, let me correct a couple things. I, up until a couple months ago, I was the executive director. I moved up here from Southern California with my wife to take on that role as executive director somewhere around late December or January of this year. Um, my wife experienced some health issues we had to pay attention to, and I couldn't get up in the morning and go over across the water, across the estuary, to the ship and say, I'll see you at the end of the day. Well, she was waiting for either another phone call from, with good news or bad news from a doctor. But she's fine. She got through this health scare, and it, it, it taught us both a lesson, which is you know, stay close to those you love and do what you can to. As one of my board members said, it's time for you to put your husband pants on and get to it. <laughs> so thank you, Dennis. Um, but I've stayed involved with the Potomac. We have a person who took my place, Jennifer, who's wonderful. And I've stayed involved because once you get the essence of the Potomac, and you go on the ship, you can't stop being part of it, which is when you when you heard there are volunteers that care for the ship and, and keep it spotless and clean, and our docents, volunteer docents, when the when the ship goes out, they're all there because of the love for the ship, and it's, it's a remarkable experience. I'm certainly taking names today of anybody that wants to volunteer and be a docent on the ship. Um, and I, 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 would, I would fail in my duty as a representative of the, of the Potomac if I didn't mention it's all Wally's fault that I'm here. 
If he hadn't put up his hand to get the ship and save it, I wouldn't be here today. So again, Wally, thank you publicly, and it means a lot. And the other role that Wally plays for me, I've learned recently, one of my talks I gave a couple months ago, is I always need a fact checker when I'm out there doing these talks. I might get some of the timelines off a little bit. It's all about the story, and I hope I can convey that to you today in the story. So let me frame it in the history of my family and my dad, Elliot. Elliot sits right smack in the middle of the children of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Anna is the oldest. Jim, who you saw in the video, is the next. My dad was next, and then Franklin Jr. and John. And Elliot was, the, was, as he probably referred to himself many times with me, because he probably thought I was the same, he was the black sheep of the family. He got in more trouble than anybody thought he could, and he did it really well. And as, as I was growing up, I think I got in a lot of trouble with him, but he always put his arm around me and said, it's okay, you'll get over this, we'll get over this. So I think he understood where, where I was coming from with some of my ridiculous behavior as a teenager. He's one of those people that um, told me lots of stories growing up, my dad could get up and give a speech and a talk anywhere. I saw, saw him do it many times with his mom. When Eleanor came to stay with us in, in Minneapolis for about 10 days, they were having a, um, at the museum in Minneapolis, they were having an exhibit of the, of the FDR White House. And they brought out a lot of furniture from the Oval Office. And Eleanor was there for 10 days or a little more to give a talk on a regular basis around town and at the museum. And she would go up to give her talk. She'd have a little clipboard with her, a little piece of note, and she'd speak from that. But my dad would get up and speak with no notes. He just got up and said, just say what you think is true and what's honest and speak from your heart. And that's what he did. And so I watched him do this many, many times as a, as a sort of a fundraiser for different causes. And then finally, as, as mayor of Miami Beach, while we lived in Miami Beach, he was the mayor and got up and spoke many times. And again, almost all of it off the cuff and just kind of knew how to do it. So I took my cues from who I can, the man I consider the master at getting up and doing those kinds of off the cuff remarks. Elliot was a guy who was, um, he mentioned to me once or twice about the ship. I don't remember hearing a lot about it, and that's the problem many of us might have in, in our lives as well. As you age, and your parents are either with you or not with you anymore, you probably realize at some point in your life you didn't ask them enough questions. And that's true for me. I didn't ask my dad enough questions. And here I had this guy who's a member of one of the most amazing families in the world, and I just didn't ask him enough. I did ask him a lot, but not enough and probably not the right questions. Um, so what I gleaned from Elliot while I was with him and before he passed away was that he loved his parents very much. He loved the work he was doing, both political and non-political, and he sort of loved life. He was just exuberant about life. And one of the things I took away from him was, you know, find a cause and get, get behind it and stay with it. And he did that on ma in many occasions in his life. And his mother, for me, was the reason I got involved in a lot of the causes I became part of as I, was, as I got older and after my, when my dad was still with us and after he passed away. Eleanor's work, if you've how many of you have read a biography, any biography, of Eleanor or Franklin? Okay, this is the one I just finished. It's called Becoming FDR. It's a remarkable book, a remarkable story of what polio did to FDR. I did ask my dad questions about that, and he was very clear. He said he couldn't walk. But what he did was wrestle with the, with the kids when they were young and when FDR was not able to walk. He'd sit on the floor, lay on the floor, and he'd tell the kids, try to pin me down. Lay him down and pin him down. They couldn't. None of the boys who were older than him were strong enough to pin him down. They just couldn't do it. But it gave my grandfather the strength and tenacity to stick with it and develop that upper body strength you heard mentioned in the film. And he became very proficient at moving around with the braces, with his crutches, and then Warm Springs came along and helped him along that path. But my dad made it very clear they had a very close relationship. All of his kids had a very close relationship, even though, as the more books like this I read, even though the more I learn, the more I realize they re weren't really together a lot as a family. They were and they weren't. And if you read some of these books that talk about Eleanor, you'll also learn she really defaulted by choice on not really being a mother and leaving a lot of that up to Franklin's, Franklin's mother, Sarah. Eleanor self-admitted many times she was deficient as a mother. She just quite didn't get it. As you know, she had a very difficult upbringing. Her dad was named Elliot, my father's namesake, and Elliot was Teddy Roosevelt's brother. So when Eleanor was, I think, probably 10 or 11, around that age, her father died. Her mother died a few years earlier, and she was orphaned and raised by her grandmother, who typically referred to her as an ugly duckling and gave her a self-worth and self-esteem that was pretty much as low as you could go for her whole childhood into young adulthood in, in late teenager years when she moved on 
to a school, a boarding school in France, Madame Souvestre, who taught her about life and gave her the gift of learning and the gift of reading and becoming a whole person. And she came back from that experience and was a changed woman, changed young woman, really remarkable, and became socially active, socially engaged, and was involved in so many progressive causes that as her husband, as FDR became president, he asked her to be his eyes and ears around the country, around the world. So she traveled all over the place. One of the most disturbing images of her traveling that I saw was when she came to Los Angeles during the internment of the Japanese citizens, which she detested. She begged FDR to not go ahead with it, and he did. But she came to Los Angeles to go visit a, a couple of homes where people were being taken out of their homes and tried to do something to comfort them and tell them they'll be okay. No harm will come to them other than the disgusting thing that was happening. And she, one of the pictures is of her coming out of a house arm in arm with a couple, Japanese couple, and the LA Times printed the picture the next day on the front page and said, Eleanor, go home. And it was just sort of like, how did she, how did she put up with this stuff? Well, she had the tenacity and the fortitude and the will to change the world, and I think she did. She later was seen in coming out of the coal mines in Kentucky. She went down there. I just read this in this book, I think, or another good book I'm reading called Eleanor in the Village, which is a really good one to take note of. She was told she she had a, a very close friend, and I may get the question later as to her women friends. One of her friends, Lorena Hickok, nicknamed Hick, was a reporter. And Hick traveled while FDR was president. He traveled. She traveled to Kentucky to see the living conditions of people there that FDR had not yet seen. He'd, he'd seen what was in Warm Springs, Georgia, and he traveled around that area a lot. But in Kentucky, it was uniquely different. And he and so Hick said to Eleanor, "You need to come down here, dear, and see this. See what's going on." So Eleanor went out and told the the police officer that was her guard, "I'm taking my car. She had her own car, and I'm driving to Kentucky. And no, you don't need to go with me. I'm doing it alone." And she drove down to Kentucky by herself as First Lady to tour the mines and see the living conditions there. And typically she would come back, she'd write up a report, and then at night go slip it in a little box next to Franklin's head of his, head of his bed, and he'd get up in the morning with a, with a basket full of notes, and she'd read the, he would read these and say, okay, I guess we have to do something about Kentucky. We have to do something about wherever it is she had traveled and told him to get involved in these issues. One of my favorite stories about her was um, she came to California place we all know, the Central Valley, where farm workers were working very hard doing the work they do. And she stopped the car she was in. It was, I think she had one or two police officers with her then. She was first lady. And she said, I want to stop here. I want to go out and talk to people in the field. I want to learn what their work is like. I want to meet them. So she hiked up her dress a little bit and marched out into the field. It was muddy and wet alone. And she walked out there and she stopped at a, a, a group of farm workers that were sitting there and working, and they looked up at her, and one of them said, Mrs. Roosevelt, we've been expecting you. And she talked to them for about an hour and took notes, and then went back and it, on her other journeys elsewhere, and then finally made it back to the White House to report those conditions. But it's those stories that I've learned from reading, and a little bit about my dad telling me some of this, that really motivated, motivated me to learn more about her. I loved the stories I'd read about Franklin. I loved the stories I knew about him. But it was really Eleanor's passion for justice and social justice that kind of hooked me, really, really got me. You know, she was asked by President Truman, um, Mrs. Roosevelt, would you, would you be willing to take on and be the first ambassador to the United Nations? We're forming this group. You know, you know of this, uh, the, the um, League of Nations, now, now the United Nations, and they're going to start in San Francisco. Would you be the first ambassador? And she said, no, no, Mr. President. Put me somewhere where I won't do any harm. <laughs> well, he did. He put her in charge of the group that was putting together the articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 32 articles in that document that have been, la have been laid out. They've been, they've been um, adopted by the UN but not ratified as law. So they, are, they exist now as a template for countries all over the world to use as a way to frame their own constitutions, their own ways of living and ways of treating each other. And it's a remarkable document. Um, that, that document, I did speak to her about once when I was with her in Hyde Park. We were all a big family gathering. And one of, one of the cousins or somebody older than me brought it up. And she, as she would do often, she'd sit at the head of a long table with cousins and grandchildren and so on and tell the story of this or that, whatever she was asked. And then she quickly just nod off like that, just put her head down and take a quick little power nap for two minutes and would put her head up and pick up right where she left off. It was just an amazing experience to see her do that. And I, I, now I'm happy if I get a five-minute nap in the middle of the afternoon. But she was sort of that dynamic, um, dynamic engine 
that said, I'm going to do this and we're going to do this together and you have no excuse but to be involved in it. You have to be. And I know she told that to my dad many times because he told me many stories of her urging him to do the kinds of things. But in all of those stories, in all the stories with my dad, none of them really focused on the Potomac. So I know, only knew of it briefly from one or two things and times he mentioned it. He was a, my dad had a, we had a Chris Craft um, a cabin cruiser in Miami Beach when we lived there, right on, right on Biscayne Bay. And we went all over the all over the bay, and it went all all the way down to the Keys. And it he was a terrible pilot of the sh of the ship. He ran aground all the time, but we had a blast. But a lot of times he would tell me stories of the Potomac, going on the Potomac as a young man with his father. And he said, "I know how to sail. I know how to drive a boat like this." Well, I got news for him. He didn't, wasn't quite that expert at it, but he knew knew some of what to do. One of the stories going out with my dad on that ship was he took one of his good friends, um, Congressman Claude Pepper. Some of you may have heard that name. He was an FDR Democrat from many, Claude Pepper. I think he referred to himself as Senator Claude Pepper, but he was a congressman. Really wonderful guy. He went on a bunch of, <coughs> bunch of those sailings with my dad fishing. And I was on the boat one time with my sister and my dad and my mom and uh, Claude Pepper. And we're, we're down somewhere in the Keys, and we just about run aground, but we averted it, and we're, we, so we threw down the anchor. And my dad said, okay, everybody wants to swim, jump in. So a bunch of us jumped in with my dad staying up top. And he blew the horn and said, everybody, come on back on board. So I got in line to climb up the ladder right behind Claude Pepper. Big mistake. He pulled himself up with me behind him to push him up just as his baggy trunk sort of got a little lower than I wanted. I saw more than I needed, but I did push him up on the ship. And he's just laughing the whole time. A really great guy. But he and my dad would sit and talk politics from one end of the voyage to the other end of the voyage. And I learned from them sort of... If you don't get involved in caring for what you do, you're missing the boat, no pun intended. So the Potomac, to tie it to that, is a place for stories. It's a place where work got done. And the fantail, the president would sit there with people on the, on the, on the bench. If you've been on it, you know that, that long bench you can slide back on in the fantail. That was set up in a way for FDR to pull himself back and push himself back with his braces on, with his legs out straight, and everybody sitting next to him, it was in the same position. So they were all equal, in a way, with their legs prone right, right like that. And it was where stories were told, legislation was fashioned. Francis uh, Perkins, the Secretary of Labor, was on the ship many times. I'd like to think that they fashioned uh, uh, various pieces of legislation there, unemployment and other things that she, she was involved in as Secretary of Labor. Other, other people you saw in the video, the king and queen were on the ship. My dad had been on the ship many times. But it was, again, a place of both stories, of relaxation. It was sort of, I guess, for FDR, a floating Camp David, where he got to let go of the pressures of the presidency, let go of the pressures of his family, because that was a lot of pressure on him as well, and go fishing. And as he says, you know, something caught a fish that big or not. But it became a place of refuge and a place of planning and a place of great ideas that came out of it. And you, it saw, you saw in the video that the, the ship took them north off, of, off the coast of Martha's Vineyard and further north to go out in the sea and meet with Winston Churchill to then frame the, the dialogue around the Atlantic Charter. And the way he did it was a subterfuge. He was on the ship and he went out into the, heart, out into the fog waving at all the reporters who were not allowed on that trip to get too close to him, but they were there. And he waved at, waved at all of them and said, okay, boys, I'll see you later. I'm going off fishing. And they were kept a little bit further away than normal. And the ship went, went out under cover of fog and night, and they transferred him to a military vessel. And he went further out, and he met Winston Churchill. My dad was on that cruise. I think, Wally, we've learned that, right? Just to check. He was on that cruise, and there's some pictures of him on that cruise. Stand I've got one at home of him standing right next to Winston Churchill with his arm like that with, F with FDR holding on to him. I mean, when the boys did that, when Jimmy or my dad did that, their, their arms were like guardrails, and all FDR had to do was just clamp onto it, and he could stand up straight with a cane, and it looked like he was able to stand up on his own. If they took away their arm, he couldn't do it. So my dad, the stories he would tell would be stories of that, stories of helping his dad get around and get stronger. But on that cruise, they fashioned the Atlantic Charter. On the other one that Wally just told me about that I didn't even realize was um, Wally's writing a series of updates of the history of the Potomac, which are really wonderful. And one of them was they took the Potomac down around the southern coast of Florida into the Gulf, right, over to Houston. I'm not, to Texas, where he was doing the nominating speech. FDR was doing a nominating speech for Al Smith, I believe, in Houston, right? 
I just read that part. My dad was on that cruise, and in this video, you might have seen that picture of him holding up probably not a 75-pound fish, but it was a pretty large fish. My dad was the one holding it in the checkered shirt on that, on that ship with, with, um, with his father. He did a lot of fishing. I did a lot of fishing growing up with my dad. It was a really, the things that passed along to the children included public service, um, some speaking talent, some not much. I don't have much, but at least getting out and telling stories. And I, and I admire people that do that today. And I think my dad was the one who really got me going. But I think the, the, the thing I want to, we're going to do some questions and answer in a little bit. The thing I want to say that's so important about this ship is it's still involved in the community. It's still involved in active education. Make sure you pick up one of these little brochures before I leave. It's, it tells the cruising, the, the tickets available and how many more cruises the rest of the year. And one of the things we're starting to do fairly soon, I have to work out some details, we applied for and received a grant from the West Oakland Job Resource Center. And it's an organization that's in West Oakland and they work with youth that are at great risk out of the system for whatever reason. They might have just come out of the juvenile justice system. They might be high school dropouts. Any number of reasons, these particular populations of youth are not engaged in the way you want them to be engaged in society. They don't have the skills to put a resume together. They don't have the skills to sit in an interview. So the Job Resource Training Center approached me back in June of, not this year, last year when I was first up here, and they were at a ship right next to the Potomac, and they were talking to me, and I was wearing my Potomac hat, and they said, what do you have to do with that ship over there? And I told them, and they said, we've never been on it. So I said, well, why don't you bring your crew in about a month, and I'll get it, get you on a cruise, and we'll go out. So they all came for a two-hour cruise, and there was a lot of great exclamations going on, a lot of swearing about how wonderful it was, and finally they said, we're going to write a grant. It's a federal grant and a state grant, and we want to put you in it as a training opportunity. We're not sure where it will go, but we got it. It's a little over $400,000 to do work with youth in the whole West Oakland area. Well, what we're struggling with, and this is where I need some help from people in the room, we need to find people who are really knowledgeable of the maritime industry, knowledgeable and comfortable getting up in front of students like this in a classroom. We're going to try to get the classroom from the Port of Oakland and do a lot of classroom time with the, with the students and then take them out on the ship to go out and have experience on the water, not to get certified in any way. We, don't, we can't do enough of that with the students to get them certified by being on the Potomac. But what I said earlier, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So we want them to see the bay, we want them to see the maritime industry, we want them to experience that and think outside the box they're normally thinking, which might be constrictive for many reasons. So we want to open eyes and have students get grasp this concept of, I can do that. If I can see it, I can be that. So go buy the container ships, go buy the ferry boats, go buy all the places you can see when they're on the Potomac, and then go back to the classroom setting a day or two later and start learning how to put together a story about yourself or a or resume and so on. So I need volunteers. Somebody said to me the other day I should find some retired Coast Guard people who could help me with that. And that might be worth, I have, I, don't, I have one contact over where I live in Alameda and she's in the Coast Guard now on Coast Guard Island. So I'm asking her to help. She's going on the ship this weekend so she'll get that experience and see it. So I say that because the Potomac is the vessel to do this. It's, an envi it's envisioning FDR's alphabet programs from, from, from the New Deal. It's looking at ways you can take people who are maybe disenfranchised as a third of the country were during the Depression and giving them another reason for hope, to get over fear and get engaged and be part of the community. And if we can do that for the next two years as part of this grant, using the Potomac as the vessel to get people engaged, it's a win for everybody. It's a win for the entire community where I now live, for this community, and it's a win for hundreds and hundreds of students and young people that really need that boost and if we can do that, I'll be really proud of FDR's legacy continuing today. So I think we're going to take some questions. I'll stop there. I'm sure there's other things I could talk about, but thank you. I'm going to leave these right up here. We already distributed them. Go ahead. Can I make one little small That's why you're here, Wally. <laughs> Wally Abernathy. Wants to make the guy who originally bid. We've given you a mic, Wally. Um, you there's there's a there's a misimpression on that uh, on that uh, video about the role of President Reagan. Um, the outcome is the same. We got the grant of two and a half million, but it was a little more tortured path than that. Uh, Reagan wasn't quite the advocate that the that the film uh, presents. We had when we were starting the restoration. 
we had um, looked out for federal money, and we'd, when we'd gone to Vic Fazio, who was the congressman from the Sacramento area who was on appropriations committee, to put in a special earmark appropriation for two and a half million for the Potomac. And Vic put that in. And that bill was moving along through Congress when the worst thing in the possibly that could happen is that the New York Times got a hold of it. And they had a front page story about this Christmas tree bill that was going through Congress at this time of fiscal responsibility under Reagan that had on it ornaments and it named some project on the East Coast and then the the U.S. Potomac on the West Coast, which was the last thing in the world that we wanted to have attention brought to. And said, oh, my God. Then we got word that OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, was going to not fund our $2.5 million and some other projects if, in fact, it passed. So we set up a meeting with, tried to set up a meeting and did set up a meeting with President Reagan. And so that, um, and you remember President Reagan at that time had, uh, had uh, Mike Deaver was one of his top lieutenants who was sort of his image guy. And Mike Deaver had said to Reagan, don't meet with those people because one, uh, Roosevelt was a Democrat, and two, you're presenting yourself for fiscal responsibility and restoring this yacht is not a necessary, necessary a government purpose, we'd have to admit. But it, Reagan said, no, no, I want to I want to have the meeting. I'd like to, I, I admired President Roosevelt. I'd like to learn more about the project. So lo and behold, we got a meeting with the president. And so the, the meeting, the group from our side was headed by Jimmy Roosevelt, uh, your father's brother. Um, and he was the chairman of our association. His son, Mike, is our chairman today. Um, and it included the mayor, and it included Cornell Meyer, who was head of Kaiser Aluminum at the time, and some others, and Pat Pineda, who was the president of the Port Commission, which was the owner of the boat at that time. I couldn't be there. I was involved in setting it up. I had a business meeting in Hong Kong at the time. So anyway, we got this audience with the president to talk about this appropriation that we'd heard that OMB was going was gonna to veto. And so they had the meeting. And so I was waiting in Hong Kong to try to find out what, what really happened. I got a phone call, at like, I think it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and it was Pat Pineda calling and said, oh, she said, oh, my, you can't believe. He said, that I've never seen a man wear clothes like Ronald Reagan. He is the most well-dressed man I've ever seen in my life. He's just unbelievable. I said, well, how did the meeting go? I said, well, they, Jimmy, Jimmy was a charming, charming guy. And, of course, Ronald Reagan, charming guy. And he said they just started telling stories. And they talked about what the White House was like when Roosevelt was there. And they went back and they went back and forth. They talked, and, and then, the, then the meeting was over. I said, well, what about the appropriation? And she said, you know, it never came up. And I said, I beg your pardon. <laughs> it's a little difficult arranging a meeting with the President of the United States and then to have the subject that you're having the meeting about not come up was a little discouraging, not to say the least. And she said, well, it didn't come up. But um, later we heard that when the meeting was over, Reagan, some of Reagan's staff asked him, well, what do we do about the appropriation? Thanks. And Reagan said, I think we can look the other way on this one. So Reagan was not the champion, but he did let it happen. <laughs> Thanks, Wally Evernoth. Wally's a member of the board um, and Ray's guest here today. So first of all, uh, Ford Roosevelt, uh, happy to have you as a Wednesday audience luncheon speaker, but with a name like Ford Roosevelt, I've got to ask, is it easy to get restaurant reservations? No, not at all. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm somewhere on Jack London Square and the restaurant I'm heading to has perhaps catered the Potomac, yes, I can get, <laughs> I can get reservations. Okay, so uh, talk to us. Give us the specs of the boat. What's the length overall beam draft? Say it again. The, What's the specs of the boat? What's the length overall of the Potomac? What is the beam? What is the draft? Give us just some oh, physical for people who are watching. This one. I, th I think if I remember right, Wally, again, it's 165 feet long, 175. I think the draft is 12 or 12 15, 15 yeah. draft. Yeah. Oh. And the beam? 175 
by um, uh, it's a narrow boat. It's a fast looking boat. It's a, it's a narrow boat. It's, it seems fast when you're on it, but it's not as fast as some of these. Not as fast as the sailboats you're used to seeing here. Not at all. So, what is the cruising speed when you when you tool around on think, a tour? I think it's maybe 15 miles per hour as a landlubber. Is that right? Right. Right. So we have a question from the audience. Yeah. Ed Kaikendall. Eddie, welcome back from Mexico. Ed Kaikendall is a significant member of our yacht club, contributor for years, and ran the children's toy drive every Christmas. Ed and Barbara, thank you. Well, welcome back, Eddie. Thank you. Uh, question. Since it's built like a World War II destroyer, or Coast Guard boat and narrow in the beam. Did you stabilize it when you rebuilt it? It's stabilized quite well, I must say, because I've taken, I've I had a lot of people go out on it at my urging, and all, all the people I asked to go out on the ship and they buy a ticket and go out, always the first question most of them will ask is, I don't go on the water often, am I going to get seasick? No, they're not going to have to hug the rail when they, it's very stable. It's not as stable as it was, I believe, when it was FDRs because of the modifications that were made when it was rebuilt. But it's, I've been on it. It's gone out under the Golden Gate Bridge a little distance, then come about and go back. So, Eddie, you mean gyroscopically stabilized or with fins? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean sta add stabilizers. There, there are stabilizers are an aftermarket piece for World War II craft. I have them on my power, our power boat. Our power uh, boat has them. Good and question. They, they basically will uh, look at the wave that you're rolling on, and, and as the boat heels one way or the other, they'll stabilize with fins. Like they fishing. swim like dolphins. Good question. Exactly right, yeah. All I know is it's a very stable boat when I'm on it, and that's all I care about. What's the cruise size on the boat? Uh, depending on how many passengers we have on the boat. You'll have probably as many as 8 to 10 crew members on the ship when it's out. If we have, a, like this weekend, we've got, a, um, a, I think, about 100 people going out on the cruise. It's one that I help put together for members of the community where I live. Who, and we're all going on it, and it's a, I'm going to give it, say, a few remarks about Eleanor while we're on the cruise. And... Uh, and then they'll have probably 10 crew, crew members on it, docents, volunteers who are helping keep people where they should be when we leave the dock and so on. So for those who want to come and visit it, where in Oakland is it berthed? If you take the ferry from the ferry building here and it stops at Jack London Square, it's right there. Just so, look, look, look over and there it is. So it's in Jack London Square. At Jack London Square, correct. And what's the number of visitors per year that you get to the Potomac? That's quite a few hundred. It's it's because it's it's a you can walk up to it. It's right there. So I don't count the people that just walk over and look at it from the side. I count mm -hmm. the people that take the walk on tours, the dockside tours. Mm -hmm. Probably several hundred do those during the year. Pretty much it's quiet from I'd say February, March or so through the through the early part of April. It's pretty quiet. Now I've got to ask in the room uh, for those who are have we're in the Navy. Let me see hands up for Navy guys. So Bruce Janagian, uh, author, lawyer, diplomat, he was in the Navy. He's written five books. Carl Nolte, you were in the Navy. Is that the case too? Longest serving um, columnist and writer for the Chronicle. And my some soon-to-be brother-in-law, Ken Shoniker, he's a Navy man. Ken, put your hand back up again, mate. Good. Great. And I have to take this opportunity to, to welcome my sweetheart fiance. Christine came a little bit late. Christine Mumford, nice to have you here, sweetie. Thank you. And her sister, Cynthia, came down for this talk, being interested in the Navy and so on. Um, so, so when you talk about the number of visitors, what percent of them are kids and what percent are just adults? Well, we, we do, and we have an active student uh, sailing program where we, we bring students from all over the East Bay for the most part. Some are from down the, on the peninsula when they find out about it. We have a volunteer in our office, Diane Beardsley, who's very active on recruiting students, recruiting schools to bring their students to take a cruise. It's usually a one-hour student cruise out on the bay. It might just get as far as going under the Bay Bridge and then come back. But the students get a very rich educational experience by being on the ship. And they can take as many as 45 or 50 students at a time. What's the annual budget for the program? Several million. Good question. Wally? The annual budget? Annual budget. 700000 per year. There you go. Great. And how big is your board? 22. Just, 22. We just added, right? Good. I think we just added a couple. And we have another board member that Ray brought. Joe, you're also a board member, too. 
Thanks for your service on such a fun cause. Now, I have not been on the Potomac, but having sailed the bay since 57, I've seen it ever since you guys restored it. Mm -hmm. And a good buddy, Glenn Isaacson, was part of your original restoration group and at one time president. And he is one of your champions. Every time you talk to Glenn about boats on the bay, he will say, well, you've got to get on the Potomac. And he makes a good argument yeah. for why it's not just historic and beautiful, but it's a practical, fun way for people to see the bay so they can go on a tour, but mm -hmm. also learn about this historic yacht. Well, a lot of the, almost all the cruises we do are narrated by docents, and there might be one that's a historic sites along the bay, along the San Francisco shoreline, and I'll go over to Raccoon Straits and so on. So we'll, we always have very knowledgeable narrators on the cruise. I'm working with a group now. We haven't set up a cruise for them yet, but I want to get a group, some of you may know, called the Living New Deal. And they're, they, I've gotten to be very good friends with their founders. And they, as you may know, are very um, historically minded. They, they've documented all the New Deal sites they can find in, in San Francisco. They're now down in L.A. working on Los Angeles. They've done New York City and Washington, D.C. to document all the existing New Deal sites. One of their members, Gray Breschlin, and I are friend, good friends, and I asked him one time, sitting on the fantail, how many New Deal sites do you think there are around the country? And he said, well, we documented and we have accurate information about up to 30,000. So I said, how Amazing. many do you think there are? Several hundred thousand. Amazing, that, were, yeah. that are there because of the New Deal, whether it's a post office, whether it's a building, a school door, any number of things. So we want to do a cruise with them narrating what do you see around the Bay Area when we cruise that are New Deal sites. Mm -hmm. The, the um, Coit Tower has all the murals in there, all New Deal. The Golden Gate Bridge, while Wait, it wasn't funded... not Coit Tower, but the murals were... The murals are, were right. done in, in Coit Tower. The, the, the Golden Gate Bridge was started during the Depression. It wasn't funded by New Deal funds, but it was started at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there's, there, there's sightings everywhere. So let me ask you, Andor Wally, what was the original restoration cost? About $5 million. $5 million bucks. How thick is the... It cost 15000 That's right, Wally, you bid 15000 yeah. That was just the beginning. You just get your toe in this deal. So uh, what's how thick is the hull, steel hull? Okay, Good a couple question. inches thick. Um, does she leak? N not that I found. No. It does not leak. Don't tell my fiancé that boats don't leak. I have a sailboat that's 86 years old. And I've told her that all boats leak, honey. The, our, the, the dock we're tied up to has a couple leaks on it, but the, you know, we're fixing those. Fortunately, our, our powerboat doesn't leak at all. That's... Great rivets. You said great rivets. Um, Ron, yes. Why is she not kept with the museum ships here in San Francisco? Ed Kuykendall asked a really good question. He says, what about putting it where the museum ships are, which is, of course, part of Hyde Street Pier, where we have the San Francisco Maritime National Park Association, of which Darlene is the mm -hmm. pres. Why not consider putting it there where there's lots of traffic? We have uh, literally over 100,000 visitors a year, and we could give you lots of traffic. I think the challenge I've been told by a couple of various shipkeepers and captains is um, getting it safely docked there is okay. a little bit more of a challenge than in the estuary in, at Jack London Square. I think the wave surges that come and go present a problem. Okay, so that's another issue that we could discuss in some detail later on. I'm on that board, and it would make some sense. We could increase the traffic quite a bit. So... Um, Um, so, how did your father describe his father? Pop. He called him Pop. Pop. Pops. You know, whatever he called him on a regular basis. By every definition, in anyone's definition, FDR is one of the most significant presidents, usually considered the top three with Lincoln and Washington. Uh, how did your father feel about, about him? You know, he didn't really talk about him in those terms as much as he did about a, the pre, a president, his father, doing the things that needed to be done at a desperate time in the country and then in the world. And he didn't really say, he didn't rank him in terms of presidents he knew. And my dad knew a lot of the presidents from, from his father on, but he didn't really rank him in that way. It was his father. And he talked about his father as the man, you know, that it was his father. He talked about his mother and not about, oh, Eleanor Roosevelt, this celebrated social justice warrior. No, nope. it was his mother and father. And talk to me about your relationship with Eleanor, Grandma Eleanor. I'll tell you a short story about her. Two two little stories. One was when I when I was um, we were living in Minneapolis at the time, and she came out to stay with us for about ten days with this exhibit at the Minneapolis Museum. How old were you? 
14, 13 or 14, and I'd been very involved for about a year and a half taking magic lessons at a nearby, with a nearby magician. It's just something I wanted to pursue. I got, I got pretty good at it. And so at one point during the dinner, late afternoon dinner, lunch, my mother said, oh, Ford, would you be willing to do, would you do a magic show for Gromare? I said, like, how much of a magic show? A couple of card tricks? No, no, do the whole thing. She knew what she was talking about. Okay. So I did a few card tricks. I did a couple of things with rice bowls overflowing and so on. And then I said, okay, Gromare, this is the one that's kind of tricky. I'm going to do this, though. And I called my younger brother David out, who was four years old then. And I said, David, come on out. And I went in the back room and I brought out a guillotine that was that tall. And I took, took a great big scarf and I put a, a cantaloupe or something in, 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 in the hole, one of the two holes on the guillotine, pulled up a blade, put, the, put that in there, covered it with a scarf, and down goes the blade and cuts the melon in half. So I said, come on, David, now you put your head in the top. We'll put the, another melon in the bottom. And I covered his head and the melon. And Grandma Ellen was just kind of like, I can see her turning a little bit blue a little bit white, not sure what she was going to do. And it, I did it too fast for her to say anything. I just pulled the blade up and slammed it down as David kind of yet let out a yelp. And she just sort of just gasped. And I pulled the scarf off, and David was sitting there just grinning and smiling. He knew what to do, and it was fine. So she, she appreciated my humor even then. So the other one I, I want to say about Wait, her, wait, first of all, all right. how, how much did that episode shorten her life? <laughs> Fortunately, not at all. Had to ask. Yeah, the other one that I think is even more telling about her <clears throat> with other people is one of my cousins, um, Christopher Roosevelt, before he passed away a few years ago, wrote a book about him living in the, in the White House. He was, he's, he was older than me, and he lived there with his parents for some time. And he wrote a book. I think it was, uh, I can't remember the name of it right now. And he wrote this book, and he was going to give this talk in L.A. at the L.A. Library Association. So I was asked to attend. He called me and said, why don't you go? So I go, I go to this event, and the, the chairman of the Library Association is speaking about him and says, now I want to let you start speaking. And he says, wait, wait, no, let me tell a story, Chris, about your grandmother. Because I had an encounter with her when I was very, very young. I want to tell that story. So I said, okay, go. So he said, told this story, which was when he was about seven or eight years old, the, the chairman of the Library Association, he said, your grandmother then was, was very active going to Russia to look at other forms of government and try to understand systems of government around the world. And she took a lot of heat for that, as you can imagine. And we all knew that. She was blasted in all the newspapers. And so this young boy read all that. And he saw all of it, with it through his parents. And he said to his mother, I want to write her a letter. I want to see what she's like. So he wrote a letter. Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, what are Russian children like? Your friend. And he put his name on it. And he sent the letter to... Mrs. Ellen Roosevelt, Hyde Park, New York, off it went. About a month later, he gets a letter back. He opens up the letter and said, Dear Tom, Thomas, just like you, your friend Eleanor. <laughs> so I, I like the story because what it says to me was she was like that. She was extraordinarily ordinary in her own way. She, there was no, I mean, she, we went to Hyde Park with her one time and she gave us sort of the cook's tour. And we're walking all over the place, and she's telling us about this and about that. And my dad says to her, Mama, you remember the time when I was 10? And she goes, don't tell that story. And he does anyway. Well, he apparently climbed out on the ledge of the third-story window where, he was, where his bedroom was, crawled along the ledge to his sister Anna's window, and banged on the window in the middle of the night to scare her, and then scooted back into his bedroom. Just, you know, he was, he was the black sheep of the family. So his mother said, don't tell, don't. he did tell the story in front of his own children. Not that I had any ideas to do it, but, you know, there was a sense of, their banter together was typical mom and kid. It was mm -hmm. the same. She was a pretty impressive, amazing person for me as a young guy in, uh, when I was in my late 20s and uh, head of all the marketing for CVS, the big drugstore chain. I went down in, with my chest pulled out like this. I thought I'd meet with Ellen. I would meet with uh, Margaret Mead, and I met with her and said, we'd like you to run for president. She said, oh, no, no, I'm not a politician. Uh, no, no, no. She said, I'm not the right person. I said, no, that's the line we would use. Uh, you know, Margaret Mead for president, not a politician. She said, oh, no, Eleanor and I talked about that years ago. <laughs> yeah. And I just about melted the notion of Eleanor Roosevelt. She said, uh, she had it right. Eleanor said, you don't compromise. I don't compromise. We would not be good as politicians. No, neither one of them would have been. That's right. And that's, that was her, her but premise. My but my grandmother was a politician in her own way. She was very, very active. Louis Howe, FDR's closest advisor, mm -hmm. took her and taught her how to modulate her voice and how to speak and how to engage with people. So for years, she was out on the circuit all over the country, raising funds for the Democratic Party, raising issues for the Democratic Party, and actively getting women involved in politics. And so in a way, she was a very active politician. 
Also, Wally mentioned earlier that Reagan wasn't a giant champion, but he did permit the funding of the Potomac to begin with. Of course, in FDR's day, Ronald Reagan was a Democrat. We will all recall. He voted four times for him. That's right, exactly. And he converted to be a Republican before he... Well, everybody, everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> so um, when, you, when you think about the case for FDR being a great president, what are the accomplishments that give you uh, the evidence that he w was a great president? I think that, well, clearly navigating, navigating the waters of World War II as commander-in-chief is, is pretty critical. But I think even more, as important, if not more, in his era and his time, is really what he did during the Depression to pull the country out of the Depression and put people to work. And the programs he created, which are all around us today, it's the hidden geography under our feet, it very much was a way to rebuild the economy and rebuild the, the country when it was just in, in, in shreds. And he did that. And part of what was able to make that happen was the war. And the war put a lot of people to work in building munitions and so on. So I, it, it's hard to pick just one thing, but I think clearly... Uh, another really good book is Mant Mantle um, of Command, FDR's Role as Commander-in-Chief. It's a really good book to read, too. But it's just sort of, you, I can't pick one thing. I, I would like to say, and I, I can't say, I would like to say he was a phenomenal father to his kids. He was okay. But he had other things he was involved in. I mean, when he was away at Warm Springs for months on end, or then out fishing in the little boat, the little Rococo, his kids were back in, in New York or in New York City or up in Hyde Park, and sometimes with their mother, sometimes not. So he had other things he was paying attention to, getting his health back together to try to do things to stay in politics. But my dad never mentioned he was really a phenomenal father. He didn't, he didn't, I don't think he took it as, that's just the way it was. Well, so, like some national leaders, it seemed to me that he was more a father to the nation. He and Eleanor were parenting the nation, mm -hmm. and sometimes the children, their native children, don't benefit as much from that. We have a question from Bruce Janagan. Uh, uh, the answer to um, his accomplishments, I think, if you really reduce it down, could be the fireside chats, mm -hmm. because yep. he told the public the truth in a warm and friendly way, and he employed the radio to great advantage. So I think, I think that was probably the single, amongst so many accomplishments, I think that had a great impact. Well, it was the start of mass media in politics. And, and anybody have any idea about how many fireside chats he did while he was president? Uh, only like six or so? How many? 31. 31, wow. Fireside chats. One of them, at least one, maybe two from the Potomac? We know one. Uh -huh. Right, from the Potomac. Courage, 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 courage. Right. Mm -hmm. So, it's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, it's really hard to pick one thing. I think if you listen to the fireside chats, they were delivered in a way that was so um, engaging. And even though he was highly educated and so on and came from a fairly wealthy family at the time, he delivered the speeches in a tone and an, and an effort that he put out. Was It made everybody – I mean, there's a great quote by somebody – when he died, uh, they were interviewing somebody on the street somewhere, maybe outside of Warm Springs, who, who was weeping, a man who was just kind of couldn't control himself. And, he's, and the reporter said, did you know the president? He said, no, but he knew me. <laughs> Great I think line. that speaks volumes. Yeah, and was. also to leadership itself. It seems to me that the quality which uh, he had, which in fact John Kennedy had, uh, which Reagan had, is that they were incredibly good communicators. Mm -hmm. And leadership, in essence, is being able to get other people to do what you want, yep. you know, what you're doing. And uh, that might have been a problem with FD, with uh, uh, LBJ. He was not as great a communicator at all. And it may be a problem with our current president. He may have done a lot of good things, but he's not communicating as effectively as your grandfather communicated and as John, as John Kennedy communicated and... Uh, you know, uh, Reagan, in fact, communicated. Um, listen, Ford Roosevelt, it has been so fun having you speak with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thanks so much. And Pleasure. You know, we enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll be around a little bit if there are any questions. And I see that Joe took some of the little flyers to leave around. Everybody should have a flyer. Getting, getting, a, getting a cruise ticket. Perfect. Thanks. Great. Right. Thank you. Wonderful. Great. Good going. Thanks, man. How fun. Good going for it. No, I don't know. But it's a great book. Yeah, really fun.
This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.